I'd like to welcome everyone to the second presentation in the Vitus Gen 2 webinar series. Today's webinar is on automated evaluation of grape breeding progeny to reduce the phenotyping bottleneck. My name is Raquel Callis. I'm the Extension Support Specialist for the New York Statewide Viticulture Program. I'm also part of the Extension and Outreach Team for Vitus Gen 2. A few technical notes before we start. If you move your mouse to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a menu. Click on that to open the chat bar and use it to introduce yourself, make comments, and alert me if you're having technical difficulties. Change the chat settings to send to all panelists and attendees. The default is not that. Uh, we'll use the Q&A button to ask questions. You'll find that also on the menu at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna stop midway through the presentation for questions and at the end. So our panelists today are speaking to us from three different time zones across the country. They are Lance Cable Davidson, Rachel Nagley, and Anna Underhill. Lance is the co-director of the Vitus Gen 2 project and plays critical roles on the powdery mildew, genetics, and phenotyping and breeding teams. She's based out of Geneva, New York. Rachel is located in Parlier, California, where she's a USDA research horticulturist and a member of the breeding and phenotyping and fruit quality teams. And lastly, Anna is a master's student at the University of Minnesota, where she works in Matt Clark's lab on image-based phenotyping methods for great cluster density. And with that, I'll hand it over to our first presenter, Lance. Great, thank you very much, Rachel. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're great, perfect. Okay, great. So hopefully everybody can see my slides now. Um, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk with you today about the work that we've been doing in the Powdery Mildew Phenotyping Center. Uh, when we envisioned the Vitus Gen 2 project, uh, the COPIs challenged each other to think about how we can innovate with new technologies. Uh, and that's been really successful across the project in the genotyping and phenotyping and other areas, innovations in how we do extension and our trade economics uh, and our breeding efforts. Uh, today, we're gonna focus uh, primarily on phenotyping, which is trait analysis. So today, the three of us, Anna, Rachel, and I, are going to talk about application of uh, next generation technologies for high throughput phenotyping. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the team members, uh, especially our fearless leader, Bruce Reich. Uh, it's not an easy thing to corral a group of 23 professors and researchers across the country. Uh, to get us to align on our, our research objectives and to manage uh, such a complicated project. Um, for the powdery mildew team, I want to specifically thank David Godori and Mark Ray, who are the, my co-PIs on the powdery mildew team, and the people who do the work on a day-to-day basis, Andrew, Danny, Tim, and Surya. Everybody's really outstanding to work with and we've made good progress as a team. Um, I highlight in red other speakers today, Anna coming from Matt's lab, uh, Rachel out in Parlier, and a big thanks to Tim and Raquel for organizing this. Of course, we couldn't do this project without the funding, especially Crops Research Initiative, and we have very close collaborations with our industry partners at Ian J. Gallo, California Table Grape Commission, and the National Grape Research Alliance. So in a nutshell, this project is applying technological innovations in phenotyping or trait analysis, as well as genotyping or genetic analysis to deliver breeding lines with durable powdery mildew resistance and fruit quality. And to use the new knowledge that we gain and technological innovations we make to better manage existing vineyards, recognizing that oftentimes growers don't want to replant their vineyards, they they're already set with uh, certain varieties. So this is a four year project um, funded by SCRI 23 co-PIs, and we don't just focus on one type of grape, but we work on a, an array of different types of grapes. So I wanna first start out by giving a big picture introduction to what are some of the challenges, regardless of the trait that you're looking at, what are the, some of the challenges in phenotyping traits within the context of a breeding program? And I think the first thing is to do is to recognize that breeders wear a lot of different hats, and they have to juggle a lot of different tasks, much like the cat in the hat. So 
they're simultaneously pursuing very complex breeding priorities. These may include disease resistance, uh, stress tolerance to things like cold, midwinter mid cold, um, frost damage, cold, um, drought tolerance, etc. cetera. Um, desirable viticultural characteristics, having things that grow well in the vineyard and are easy to manage, all while maintaining or innovating in fruit quality. So it's very complex goals for a breeding program. Achieving these goals require diverse knowledge, skills, and very specialized and often expensive equipment related to a number of scientific disciplines, as well as understanding the economics and markets um, of, for the products that they are going to be developing. Finally, it's important to realize that much of a breeding program is calendar-based. When it's flowering time, you need to be in the field making crosses. When it's harvest time, you need to be collecting the fruit. And so you can't be out year round at all times phenotyping every trait that you want to look at. So with these complexities in mind, VitusGen 2 developed the concept of phenotyping centers to provide specialized support and expertise along with access to cutting edge technologies for phenotypic analysis. So having given that general background, I now want to dive into one specific example, and that's powdery mildew, which is a trait that a lot of grape growers are interested in, and thus breeders are also looking at. So just to give the concept of a typical breeding approach to uh, powdery mildew phenotyping. Now, before Vitus Gen or outside the context of a genetic analysis, uh, breeders typically will observe susceptibility and throw away all individuals that are susceptible to a disease like powdery mildew. But that, while that's beneficial to the breeding program, it, it doesn't gain us knowledge about the genetics underlying that resistance. So within the VitusGen concept, we are maintaining all individuals within a segregating family and analyzing them all for their relative susceptibility or resistance. Typically, these are done on unreplicated vines because it's very expensive to have two or three or four replicates of an entire breeding family. Um, and we allow natural infection to come in and then record disease severity on a, on a four or five point scale, typically. Uh, there are many uncontrolled variables when you have such an approach. You're not controlling for the genetics of the pathogen, non-random inoculum distribution in the vineyard, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a list there of different uncontrolled variables that we have. So what we've seen over the years is there are a few resistance genes that are very easy to detect with this kind of approach. Thing, genes like RUN1, RUN4, RUN6, we can detect with a pretty coarse approach. But for the minor or moderate genetic effects, we have a really hard time detecting these with this type of vineyard experimental design. So an example in the table on the right is RUN2. Uh, this is a resistance gene that you'll see here with six observations, different years, different times of the year. We are unable to detect this known locus on chromosome 14 using vineyard ratings. Okay, so I'm going to go back now to the big picture, regardless of the trait that you're looking at. Why might we want to automate and why might we want to use computer vision, which you're going to hear about from all three presenters today. Well, one is when we're mapping in genetic families, we need to use large seedling populations, so big numbers. Uh, our goal in Vitus Gen 2 is to have 300 seedlings per family. And in addition to that, you need to have multiple replications. So sample the same vine multiple times to be able to statistically analyze it and identify statistical significance uh, for the trait of interest. So when you have such big numbers, every experiment you're doing is in the thousands of samples, uh, you really need to reduce the time for evaluation. So by increasing sample throughput through automation, uh, we can either achieve greater replication or we can think of additional treatments. And I think you'll see some examples of that today. In addition, often a computer is more objective than a person is. This, this idea that I showed you about uh, rating disease severity in a vineyard is, is subjective and uh, subject to rater bias. Also, when you're looking at thousands of vines in a day, 
you're subject to fatigue. Um, so computer vision also gives you opportunities for new observations and new traits that you might not otherwise be able to uh, pursue. And so I'm gonna dive into powdery mildew for the rest of my talk now and give an example of what we're doing in the phenotyping center. And I want to highlight that we're now in the sixth year of being a phenotyping center for the great breeders. So what I'm gonna talk about has been a huge effort to get to the point where we are. So our laboratory approach, in contrast to the, the natural disease incidence and vineyards approach, uh, we built this based on, on a hypothesis. And that is that we may need tighter control for minor or moderate quantitative resistance genes. So what happens is breeders ship us leaves for their segregating populations, maybe up to 300 uh, different seedlings with replicate leaves. Um, we surface sterilize those and punch these one centimeter discs that you can see down at the bottom left. And we're able to put up to 330 uh, leaf discs, usually it's one per uh, seedling, on auger and we do a controlled inoculation with a single isolate of powdery mildew. And after four years of work, uh, we found uh, in the powdery mildew phenotyping center, we found a really useful metric for quantifying powdery mildew. And that is essentially, we let the powdery mildew grow on these leaf discs for about eight to 10 days. And then we quantify the density of colonization that we see from the fungus. So these panels C and D are leaf samples that we've cleared the chlorophyll and stained the fungus with a blue stain. The yellow lines represent an imaginary line through the middle of the leaf disc, the horizontal middle and the vertical middle of the leaf disc. And every time one of these lines crosses a hypha, we count it. Um, and the more hypha there are, the, the more susceptible it is. And this translates very nicely into identifying uh, QTL underlying disease resistance. So this is just a couple examples for two well-known genetic loci in grapevine. REN2 on chromosome 14, I showed before, six times in the field we couldn't detect it. In two out of three experiments we ran in the laboratory with this approach, we detected this locus. REN1 is a stronger locus, you can detect it in the field, but you can see based on the R squared values, we can explain more of the phenotypic variants for this trait in the laboratory, more than half of the phenotypic variants, in fact, in the laboratory. So we're much more confident about the loci we're detecting. But it is a numbers game. And so if you think about the numbers that we were running in Vitus Gen 1, we hoped to get up to 200 seedlings. Now we're talking about 300. We typically would have 1,600 discs in an experiment, about half an half a million observations per experiment. And this, depending on the person, would take anywhere from 13 to 65 working days. So that's a lot of effort just to collect the data. And that's after you have, that's just in the observation of the samples. So that's not to mention the 15 work days that it takes to prepare the samples. So we were getting really good data, but there are a number of limitations. It's only for one isolate. It's a snapshot of the phenotype at a certain number of days after inoculation. And it is physically exhausting to spend so much time at a microscope. So what we started developing at the end of Vitus Gen 1 and now have pretty good system set up that I'll talk about today, excuse me, is automated, automated analysis. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, this is a collaboration with Mark Ray's program. His group uh, largely built the system, engineered the system that I'll talk about today, and a collaboration with David Godori's group uh, here at Cornell in Geneva. And David uh, brought about some really nice changes to the optics recently that's, that's allowed us to really increase throughput. So this is a picture of our third version our, of the powdery mildew robot. Um, and on the right hand side, you see two leaf discs. Those are examples of images that we automatically capture with this robot. And at the bottom is a zoomed in image of one of these leaf discs. And I think you can see the thin straight hypothreads of powdery mildew. This is 
far before you would be able to see the, the powdery mildew fungus with the naked eye. So in my talk, I'm gonna tell you about uh, basically two steps in our automated methodology. First, how we use automated high resolution image capture of live leaf disc samples, unlike Phytogen 1 when we were clearing the chlorophyll and staining the fungus. By having live image capture, we are able to take repeated measures on the same samples. In addition, then as a separate step, we have image processing based on counting fungal hyphae. <coughs> I apologize. So for the imaging of the leaf samples, you've already seen the, the tray that we use with leaf discs. We use a camera with a 45 megapixel sensor, There's high resolution. Uh, a single pixel represents about 1.9 square micrometers. Recently, we've increased, we've been able to capture that leaf disc in a single image. By increasing the coverage at high resolution, increasing the depth of focus, we're able to get more information with fewer images, which has been really the underlying driving factor between, behind us being able to get speed while maintaining precision. We use LED lights for illuminating the hyphae. Uh, XYZ stage that moves between samples and auto focuses for the samples. And what we do is we capture multiple images per leaf disc and then have a focus stacking software to compress them into a single sharply focused image. Our goal is to obtain 1600 image samples in a nine hour workday. And this is just a close up of what one of those leaf discs looks like. So how that comes into computer vision as a separate step. Um, first, uh, you, so these are numbered one through four, these images. So number two, this is a step called color segmentation, where we improve the contrast between the leaf and the fungal elements, uh, the hyphae. The second, hyphae are, are similar in shape to tubular structures. So we have a step called fi fibrometric filtering. Um, and then huff transformation. This detects straight lines, and we need some information about features of these lines. And we bring this information into neural networks in order to discriminate between powdery and mildew hyphae and other elements on the leaf disc. You can look and see, okay, there's veins. Those are tubular. Why isn't it counting a leaf vein? So we need uh, our computer vision system to understand the differences between what powdery mildew hyphae look like and other uh, tube-like elements on the leaf. So this is the last slide for this component of the talk um, on the status. So we've now built two powdery mildew robots. We uh, can now image about 1,200 discs per day, which is an 18-fold improvement just in the last three months. Uh, it's really been exciting uh, progress since we got the whole team on board uh, and started moving forward. So now, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've already collected 5,000 images. I think it's more because we just ran two experiments this week. Uh, we have five more genetic experiments planned for this growing season. And what's nice is we can image at uh, multiple days and watch disease progress over time. We hypothesize that this may enable us to identify more loci underlying uh, powdery mildew resistance. It's a continual process to optimize the computer vision algorithms. We look at things like um, what percentage of the time does the computer correctly call a uh, fungal hyphae and what are the false positive and negative rates. So there's a trade-off sometimes. Um, and also we're pitting the humans against the machines, wondering who's going to win. Um, so we are using the same leaf disk images that we've captured and some of us are sitting at our computers and doing the hyphal transect counts manually. We'll compare those data with the computer vision data. And at the end, of the end of the day, the way that we determine the best phenotyping method is based on what best uh, explains the, the genetics behind disease resistance. This approach will help to identify markers and candidate genes for resistance. Uh, we're going to be learning a lot about race specificity and isolates of powdery mildew that can overcome uh, powdery mildew resistance genes that will help to define our breeding strategies. Uh, and as Bruce liked 
to point out, at the end of the day, we need to validate these results in vineyards, of course. Um, laboratory results are not our end goal. So Ra Raquel, I don't know if there are time for a couple questions or if we need to move on to Anna. Yeah, we can, we can let people ask some questions if they want. Um, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and I'll give everybody half a minute to post something. If there's nothing now, we'll move on to Anna and then uh, we will come back for more questions at the end. Thank you, Lance, that was very interesting. Lance, this is Tim Martinson. If I can jump right in here. Um, so do you do these tests on the different populations with different strains of powdery mildew? Yes, exactly, we do. And one of the, the approach with Vitacin 1, we had to choose just one isolate for each population. And we found that we get different results depending on which isolate is. That's because many of the resistance genes we're working with are what we call race specific. Um, and we would find a set of QTL with a given isolate. If we had the time to use a different isolate on that same family, we'd find a different set of QTL. Um, but because of the time constraints with manual collection of hyphal transect data, it really wasn't feasible to do that on a large scale. One of my visions for Vitashin 2, if we get this throughput up even a little bit more, we can envision that it wouldn't be that difficult to, in the same experiment, have eight replicates of leaf discs for one isolate and eight replicates for leaf discs for another isolate, <laughs> and thus be better able to identify race-specific resistance genes. I'm sorry, my throat is shot. I think we should move on to Anna. <laughs> yeah, I think we don't have any other questions, so we'll let Anna take the wheel. Thank you so much, Lance. Awesome. So let me just get my screen set up here. All right. Does that look good to everyone? That's perfect. Go for awesome. It. Yeah. So my name is Anna Underhill and I am a master's student in uh, Dr. Matt Clark's lab, as was uh, previously noted. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my work uh, that I do in cluster compactness specifically. Um, both our image analysis methods, so just sort of what uh, Lance has just touched on with their work in powdery mildew, um, and then also using that data to perform some QTL mapping in hopes of, of someday integrating this into our breeding program. So why cluster compactness? Um, why we're interested in this trait at all? Uh, as I'm sure all of you know, it's a very easy trait to observe, right? You can see um, kind of on the left, those some some very compact clusters, uh, and then also some very loose clusters. Uh, the one on the far most right, Vitis riparia, is one that we work with a lot um, in our cold hardy breeding program. And as you can see, it's a very loose, uh, open cluster. And so we can see this trait. It's, it's very easy to observe visually, um, but it's hard to measure. As Lance talked about, things that have these subjective measurements um, are difficult from, from one person to the next. Uh, you know, what you call compact or how do you measure that? Um, obviously, it's a good trait, sort of a good candidate to measure by computer so you don't have um, someone that needs to actually rate these clusters for compactness. And why we're interested in cluster compactness, um, there's been quite a few studies done that, that show a really strong connection um, between disease incidence and pest infestation uh, and cluster compactness. So especially botrytis is one that gets mentioned a lot. Uh, if you have berries that are too close together, um, deformation can occur, micro cracking, and then also actually um, some changing of the cuticular wax on the berries that leads to uh, easier infection of the berries with this fungus. Um, sour rot and bitter rot have also been shown to be correlated with a higher cluster compactness. Um, and grapevine berry moth there on the bottom right um, also seems to prefer a, a denser cluster. Um, if you have a nice little microclimate for bugs to live in and lay their eggs, um, they like that and, and we don't. So uh, ideally you would want something in, in a program that's not too compact, that you don't have to worry about these, these pest and disease issues, um, but obviously something that's still um, yielding well. 
So what controls cluster compactness? Um, it's a trait that's still under quite a bit of, of, um, of question. Um, it's complex, I think, is the, is the answer. Uh, two key traits in this study by Tello, who I think actually is on, um, on this webinar today, uh, showed that in these 125 accessions that they studied, uh, the two traits were key um, in influencing this trait, and that was total berry number um, and the length of the rachis. So how, how long, how elongated a cluster is, and how many berries it have. Um, but it doesn't explain all variation and it, it does fluctuate. Um, so it's not the end all be all ex explanation of, of why clusters are compact or, or not compact. And in terms of genetics, that's also something that's, that's still uh, sort, of, sort of a question. Um, so this slide, as you see here, is the 19 chromosomes of grapes. And just looking at these different genetic areas that have been found, um, this study was done, it was a cross between ruby seedless and sultanina. Um, and they were able to identify some different uh, cluster architecture um, components. So you can see here, uh, rachis weight, rachis length, uh, number of nodes, berry number. So you see there's quite a few different regions, um, certainly lots of loci that, that seem to be impacting um, these different cluster compactness components. Um, obviously these things do impact cluster compactness, but they aren't compactness itself, right? They're, they're components that, that all play into it. And as I alluded to earlier, um, it's sort of a difficult trait to measure. Um, so one of the ways it's done now, sort of most commonly, is by just a visual score, um, a one to nine, and that's the uh, International Organization of Wine and Vine, the OIV, that, that determines that. Um, so you see their scale here, this one to nine. Um, berries, are they clearly separated? Can you see the pedicels? Um, can you not see the pedicels? Are the berries so close together that they're actually deforming each other? These are some of the things that you um, that you would use as a as an index to try to decide what your rating is. Um, this picture on the left shows kind of two examples they give you for both loose and compact clusters. Um, they also give some example cultivars. But again, you know, you have this one, three, five, seven, nine. Um, who's to say? You know, what I think is a four is is maybe someone else's three or a five. And a question that comes up kind of in our program, what if you don't have anything that's super dense? And so everything is, is being rated, say, a one to five, perhaps. Um, is that really capturing all the variation in your population? And is that score really uh, the most useful way to, to phenotype? Um, and so improving on that has kind of been my goal and the, the goal of this project. So image-based phenotyping, just in general, is, is becoming more prevalent in grape and, of course, many other species. Um, but in grape especially, uh, as we know, it's, it's kind of a complex crop to work with sometimes in terms of those phenotyping challenges. Um, berry size, you know, if you've ever phenotyped that by hand, taking a caliper and, and measuring individual berries is pretty time-consuming. It's pretty tedious. Um, so this has become a trait that's, that's become popular to phenotype uh, by images. Um, you see a couple examples here. Quite a few studies have been done uh, with this trait. Berry number, kind of in the same vein. Um, berry counts are, are kind of arduous, uh, long, take a long time. Um, and this is another thing, it's, it's becoming popular not only in lab, you know, post-harvest counting, um, but also in the field. You'll see kind of over here um, on the right-hand side, adapting um, imaging technology actually for the field and being able to drive through a vineyard and take pictures and then isolate uh, grape berries from um, those images and have those counted while they're still out in the field. Um, even to the far right, you'll see this is actually an app that was developed um, to count inflorescences. So, so farmers could go out and, and use that and have kind of a little estimation of, of yield almost before, um, before grapes were even formed. So getting into my experiment here, um, a population was used, this is a, this is a Vitis Gen population. So if you're familiar with um, Soon Lee Tae's powdery mildew research, um, this is the same population that was used in that, um, in that research. Uh, so these are the two parents, it was a biparental population. We have two breeding selections, uh, Minnesota 1264, the female parent, and then Minnesota 1246 is the male parent. Um, and as you can already kind of see, they're, they're segregating, or not segregating, excuse me, um, they're very different for cluster compactness. They're, they're pretty markedly different phenotypes. Um, this cross was made in 2010. They're planted on a two-foot spacing, so they are pretty close. Um, it's about one and a half rows. There's only one replication in the field, uh, and these are planted with the rest of our research vines at the Horticultural Research Center. 
Um, so this cross was made, and, and I think there was 140 progeny originally, but, but after several <laughs> harsh winters um, and damage and whatnot, we have uh, 123 remaining. And as you can see, there's lots of diversity. So this is a segregating population for many traits, um, which is why it's been useful for us for research. Um, but you can see color, um, size, shape, um, shoulder presence, uh, a lot of things. So uh, lots of diversity in general. And so I set out to, to phenotype these um, with an image-based method. And this is based on an existing method published um, by Diego et al. in, in 2016. Um, this is just kind of a little schematic of how I set up my camera and my grape. Um, upon harvest, I took these inside. I had a DSLR camera set up here on a tripod. Um, and just using a, an alligator paper clip, essentially, um, hanging these up, illuminating them, and then photographing them um, on each side. So four photos of each cluster. So rotating it 90 degrees every time. So you had kind of a, a four sides, essentially, of the, of the cluster. Um, after that, they were corrected for color. So I'm um, getting a, a, both a, a contrast between the background and the grape berry, and then also um, an accurate color in these clusters. After this, uh, images were segmented based on color. Um, so sort of similar to what Lance was talking about um, with the powdery mildew. Uh, however, this was more of a semi-automated method. So how this method worked was I would go in for a genotype and I would define a background color, a berry color, and a stem color. And then the program would segment this whole image based on those parameters that I had set. Um, and then I would be able to run through the rest of the images from that genotype based on this training set and have it, have it um, segment them for me. So it wasn't a totally automated method, but it was a somewhat automated. And then lastly, I wrote a script um, for MATLAB to, to measure several uh, traits of interest in these segmented images. Um, so you can kind of see on the left things I was looking for, um, the whole area of the cluster, um, the length of the cluster, its perimeter, um, and then kind of percentages. So percentage wise, you know, how much of this of this cluster is taken up by berry pixels, how much is taken up by stem rachis pixels, and how much of it is empty space. Um, there were also several calculated measurements um, based on these, these different traits that were extracted. Uh, and these, these were found to be somewhat explanatory in another um, study, which is why I included them. So compactness shape factor is one, roundness aspect ratio, just different calculations based on these, these extracted traits. So then after that, uh, after everything was photographed, I just did some conventional phenotyping as well, um, looking at the cluster weight, the length, uh, the count of the berries, the 20 berry weight, uh, and then the cluster compactness, uh, it was given a score on that one through nine kind of conventional scale, and then it was also given a score uh, cluster weight over cluster length squared. And so this is just looking at some of the histograms um, for the traits that I found. Uh, so you can just see here that it is a segregating population. You'll see the parents noted in those red and green dotted lines. So the way that this, um, this population is falling is, is quite normal. Um, it's, it's segregating for traits of interest that are most likely contributing to cluster compactness. And so then what I've done now um, is just taken a simple correlation between these two measures of compactness and these various traits that were extracted from these segmented images. And you can see here their, their correlations. So these are R squared values. Um, so essentially using these, how much of the variation in cluster compactness is explained. Uh, both positive and negative correlations, those top four uh, are quite high, as you can see. Um, up to 72% variation uh, compactness shape factor looked pretty good in terms of an index for measurement. Um, some correlated negatively, so as you can see, something like as space percentage goes up, compactness goes down, which makes sense is if you have a, a cluster that's fairly loose, um, it, it won't be as compact, and, and that makes sense. Uh, and several of these were not super helpful, as you can see, low correlation coefficients, um, which is what was found in a, in a study that this, was, this method was based off of. So um, it does concur with things we already know um, in this different population. Um, the coefficients also in this previous study did change by year. Uh, so 
the largest coefficients were coming from different traits the first year number of berries second year length of the cluster um, kind of etc so as I repeat this the next year I am interested to see whether we'll see that or not uh, I can imagine um, there's definitely some environmental effects here so I'll be interested to see when we repeat this in the fall um, if it comes out the same and then I also did some QTL mapping, um, so trying to associate some genetic regions of interest with these traits. Um, and what I found was a lot of these QTL that were popping up um, above these significance thresholds were only significant at the chromosome-wide level um, and not necessarily at the genome-wide level. Um, so what that means is that they're regions of interest, but they, they couldn't really be defined, I don't think, um, as a definite you know, this is where we think these traits are acting. Um, so certainly some further work to be done. One thing that was kind of buoying to see uh, was that several of these traits um, had already been mapped to the same chromosomal regions, uh, pretty wide regions on my map, as you can see, but um, berry weight, rachis length, berry count have all been isolated on the same chromosomes. So certainly something interesting to keep looking into. So some of the limitations of these projects, um, mine in particular, if you try to do color segmentation um, on a cluster, as you can see on the left, that's all the same color, um, it doesn't really work very well. So if you have something that's all green, it's quite hard for the program to differentiate, you know, well, what's stem, what's berry, um, it's very tough. And that's just an inherent limitation when you have so much color variation in a population. Some other issues I had, uh, as you heard me mention, being on a two-foot spacing, some of these grapevines are not very happy. Some of them are looking pretty sad. So when I have fruit like this, this kind of scraggly fruit, it's hard to say, you know, is this due to genetics, right? Are these just very loose clusters? Or is it just the environment? You know, are they, are they deficient? They're just not performing well, and they're kind of outliers. Well, again, it's, it's hard to say, and that's something that um, would have to kind of be a judgment. So dealing with this limitation, um, one thing I, I think I might try in the future is doing a different segmentation method. So maybe not a color-based segmentation entirely, something that's more morphological. This image on the left comes from Nathan Miller of UW-Madison, uh, who does a lot of work with phenotyping in general and other crops. Um, he's released packages on Cyverse that, that have been used, um, and he's produced some of those images for me. And then also, as I kind of mentioned, you know, trying to get those clusters out that, that I don't think are going to be informative for genetic, you know, mapping um, and try to see if that improves the analysis at all. Additionally, my next step is to take, you know, instead of looking at all these indices separately and just doing a linear um, regression is to put them all together into a model, most likely a partial least squares model, um, and to use them all in conjunction with each other to produce a model that's, that's explanatory, uh, more so for cluster compactness than they would be on their own. So yeah, this is a part of Vitisgen 2. I'm at the University of Minnesota. Um, Dr. Matthew Clark is my advisor. And any questions, I guess, Raquel, if there is time for that? Yeah, we'll actually hold questions for the end. Uh, people feel free to submit them, but we'll move on to Rachel so that she has time to finish, and then we will end with questions for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so can you guys see my screen okay? Perfect. Okay, so kind of continuing along the same vein that Anna and Lance have spoken about, I'm still gonna be talking about high throughput phenotyping for fruit quality. Um, I'm gonna take a step back though, because a lot of the quality characteristics that we've done in the past with the Vitus Gen have been related to wine grape quality, and with Vitus Gen 2, we wanted to add in components related to table grape quality. Um, I predominantly work with table grapes, and some of the things that are more important for that industry are going to be texture, uh, berry size is very important, uh, cluster architecture also plays a large role, and these are things that really um, play a large part in a variety's acceptance, consumer acceptance. Um, so while these are not table grape varieties, I like this picture because it just shows some of the diversity of shape, size, berry color, um, cluster compactness architecture that is present in existing grape varieties. Um, as Anna talked about, there has been work done previously on cluster architecture and there are a lot of different things that contribute to this. Um, how important 
each of these individually are. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in the area. But regardless, there are a number of qualitative descriptors, especially for the mapping aspects. So for this project, um, or at least this phase of the project, I have two different populations that we're working with. Um, they're both field-grown plants. Uh, the first population is our 113527, and this is about 200 different individuals. They segregate for cluster uh, size, shape, berry color, size, shape. Um, you can see an example over there on the right. Um, and this is our second population, which is the Tamiami. And this was, again, another field-grown plant um, set of plants. This one has about 350 individuals, but you can see that it still segregates for a number of different cluster characteristics. So Anna and Lance have talked a lot about um, different methodologies that we have going for evaluation. So this is going to be a little bit broader and I'm going to spend less time talking about details as far as these um, things go. For our system, we were looking at doing, again, 2D imaging for architecture um, using images of clusters with and without berries and then detached berries that we then scanned. Um, the reason that we looked at this was because Part of Vitation, you know, we're working with large numbers of individuals. So Lance mentioned that we want at least 300 individuals for a population. So if you end up with 200, 250, 300 individuals for a population, and you need to evaluate five clusters for each individual, um, that can be several thousand clusters that you'll need to evaluate for these traits. And with harvesting times being variable, but having a rather narrow window, um, that's a lot of, that's not necessarily realistic to accomplish. Um, especially if you don't have space for storing these clusters. So um, even though you're just taking images, we also have a number of things that we have to take by hand as well. Um, so for example, we also count number of berries per cluster. We do cluster weights, we do average berry weights. Um, and then of course there's the time spent actually going through the system and analyzing the data. Um, and if you do all of this by hand, it takes about 15 minutes per cluster, which as I said, is not really realistic or feasible. Um, so for the automation side, um, this is work being done by Amy Tab at the USDA ARS in West Virginia. So she's working with the scanned images and the 2D images of these clusters, and she's looking, she's developing automated systems to be able to detect um, length, width, area. Um, for the berries, she's also looking at um, things like eccentricity to say, okay, well, how round are these berries? Because as I said, for table grapes, berry shape also plays a role in consumer acceptance for the clusters. Um, our initial go through was just looking at length and width of the cluster, but now we're also putting in parameters to be able to um, look at shape of those clusters as well. Since as I showed you in earlier pictures, sometimes the widest part of the cluster isn't always at the top. Those, so your traditional cluster shape isn't necessarily what you're gonna see. Um, so Amy's doing a lot of work on this in terms of automation. But again, these are still time consuming and it's not exactly where we want to end up. So right now, we're working more along the lines of 3D cluster imaging. Um, so ideally, we would just take a cluster, we would put it on a 3D scanner, um, we'd scan it, it would create this 3D image of our grape cluster and we'd be able to use that for all analyses. Unfortunately, the resolution isn't high enough. So instead, what we're looking at doing is developing um, reconstruction through imaging. So Amy's constructing, we call them image boxes, for lack of a better term, with um, cameras placed at set points with a cluster hanging in the middle. So the cluster will get imaged from each of these places, and the cameras, of course, are calibrated in such that she knows where they're all at. And then she uses her, she's developing software to do 3D reconstruction. Um, so we're working on this with grapes, so I don't actually have images of the grapes to show you. So this is one that she's done previously, but this is one of her trees. Um, so through these 3D reconstructions, we're anticipating being able to really look at Rekha's architecture better. Um, so branch numbers, angles, berry attachments. So some of the earlier studies that have looked at these in grapes, they were all done by hand. So for example, there was a previous paper looking at Rekha's angle. Somebody actually went through by hand and measured with a protractor every single rigus angle. Um, as you can imagine, that is time consuming. And when we're talking about high throughput methods, it's not really feasible. Um, 
of course, an important part of all of this is the validation and optimization step. So even with earlier steps where we're looking at automation, we're still using humans to go through and manually evaluate these as well to make sure there's a good correlation between the methods. For the 3D reconstruction, we'll still be doing that, but we also wanted to um, look at other options. So um, this summer, we've um, spoke with him and Dan Chitwood at Michigan State University is actually going to be doing some X-ray CT scans of our reguses as well. And we'll be comparing Amy's 3D reconstructions with what Dan's actually getting from X-ray scans. So you'll be able to see um, from the X-rays here, you can see you can actually count total numbers of berries. You can get um, rachis angles and total number of branches. So this will be a good way for us to be able to make sure that our 3D reconstructions are actually um, accurate. So the other phase of this is the fruit texture and juice quantity or juiciness. Um, so when we've talked about cluster compactness or rachis architecture, there's been a lot of work that's been previously done. So with fruit texture juiciness, there really hasn't been as much work done. There aren't markers available. And while we expect these traits to be controlled by multiple genes, we're not actually, we don't have data necessarily to support that. Um, so because we expect this though to be controlled by multiple genes, we're hoping to, we need quantitative data to be able to map. So traditionally, when you're measuring fruit texture and juiciness, you would use taste panels. You would have large groups of people come in, they would taste various samples, they would rate them on scales of say one to nine, saying how crispy a grape is. And this can be very accurate, especially when you take averages across all these individuals. However, it's time consuming and you need lots of individuals to come and eat grapes. So instead, we're look, um, what we're using are universal testing machines equipped with, um, well, this one's a Kramer shear cell for looking at texture profile analyses or TPA. So TPA um, gives you three different values. They give you gumminess, which is um, mostly used on semi-solids, so think gummy bears. And this is a metric of your hardness by your cohesiveness or how well something sticks together. Springiness is just what it sounds like. When you squish it, how much does it bounce back up to its original shape? Um, and these together are used to calculate your chewiness, which is actually what we're using for the grapes. Um, and this is just your gumminess times your springiness. And someone's asked me this earlier, and yes, these are legitimate terms. Gumminess, springiness, and chewiness are real terms. They're not things I made up. Um, so just, just to give you an example of what this looks like. So for very springiness and chewiness here, each of these Y, Y1, Y2, Y3, these are all different grape varieties. And you can see on a scale of zero to one, how much they bounce back on their springiness. So 0.9 means that it bounces up pretty well once you chew it once. Um, whereas 70 or 0.7 down here, that might not look like a huge difference, but that 0.2 difference could really be a huge difference when you're eating something. In general, when your springiness goes down, your destruction increases. And of course that affects your chewiness. So how these numbers, or how does chewiness and springiness relate to consumer experience? That we're still working on. Um, we don't have any sort of metrics and we're in discussions with industry members to try and figure out how we're gonna define these texture standards. So how do we define, a, or what value is a crispy grape? What value is a meaty grape? Um, so if you guys have any feedback on that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Um, the other aspect of this, like I said, is the juiciness level. So um, each box in this picture, colored box, represents a different grape cult or a different grape line in our 113527 population. And you can see that the amount of juice in mills that you get out of our samples varies greatly. So the box in the picture on the left, um, that's our Kramer shear cell. You can see that you fill it up with berries, um, and then these blades are what pierces the sample. So when it goes through the sample, uh, this is what the picture in the middle with the graph is what you'll get. The first peak is when the first time the blades go through the box, because to get chewiness and gumminess you need, and springiness, you need to go through the box twice with those blades. So just if you can see what it looks like real quick. So the blades very slowly move through the box. You can see they crush the grapes. The grapes are gonna crack. Um, releasing liquid as the blades go through. The blades will go all the way through, lift up, and then go back through. 
So right now we're evaluating a single mapping population with about 200 individuals. So that's the 11, 35, 27. And we're doing five clusters per plant to get this, these numbers for chewiness and springiness. And we're also looking at juiciness or how much juice comes out of these samples as well. Um, so for the future, we're really trying to evaluate additional mapping populations. And we'd like to develop these numeric ranges for this, the texture um, with the ultimate goal, of course, of building these genetic loci or identifying genetic loci associated with fruit texture and juiciness. So just real quick, uh, to thank the people who are working hard on this, Amy, like I said, is from West Virginia at uh, the USDARS. She's spent a lot of time working on the automation of this in terms of um, analyzing these image data that we're going through. And Dan's going to be working a lot. He doesn't know it yet. Um, he doesn't quite know how much, I guess I should say. And then, of course, there's a whole slew of students and technicians who've spent countless hours counting berries, taking images of berries, and trying to do some of this cluster data. Um, so in, just to summarize, um, high throughput phenotyping of Vitus gen is really going to allow us to evaluate larger numbers of individuals with a greater precision and accuracy than traditional methods, with the ultimate goal of hoping to develop genomic region markers associated with genomic regions so that um, we can really screen individuals and have more effective breeding for disease resistance and fruit quality. So we've talked to you about a few different aspects of um, high throughput phenotyping from powdery mildew, cluster compactness, and um, fruit texture stuff. And if we have any questions, we're more than happy to hear them. Great, thank you, Rachel. That was very interesting. If your uh, Kramer shear machine breaks, I volunteer uh, to test grapes for you. <laughs> um, Bruce wants to know, what is the role of skin, skin texture and overall fruit texture? Oh, okay, so, and Anna, if you want to chime in, you're more than welcome to chime in, chime in too. So I would say that um, skin thickness is going to play a role. We don't have a huge variation in skin thickness in the, the one population we're working with, which is kind of nice. Um, but there are other methods there are other methods to evaluate skin thickness, but for table grapes, typically the skin thickness um, is detectably different from berry texture. Um, so that would be part of our descriptor panel and trying to defer, determine whether or not numbers are related to overall texture or skin combined with texture. Does that make more sense, Bruce? Uh, let us know if not, Bruce. I think that, that made sense. Um, he also wants to know if imaging systems can be used to estimate seed, seed remnant size. I'm not sure who wants to take that question, but. Yeah, oh, sorry, go back. Um, so in general, I would say that yes, they should be, but, and that was our original intent with the berry scans was being able to look at seed remnant size as well, but that, you, can, you have to have very precise cuts when you're doing it. Otherwise, you don't have a clear image of the seed trace. Great. Okay. And then we have a question for Anna. Uh, in sampling clusters, were the samples chosen from primary shoots? Did you use a sampling method to control for cluster un uniformity in terms of development? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say primary shoots, yes. Um, in terms of what we were able to get, so um, as you probably saw from some of those images, some clusters are, are really nice. Um, and for those ones that were nice, often we were looking at a really great vine where we had a lot of choice. Um, and in those cases, um, we're ha we were harvesting uh, three clusters per vine. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. Um, but we're trying to get the most representative uh, samples, basically. So three um, representative clusters. Uh, but on those vines that you know, we, we only had a few clusters. Um, we we kind of just took what we could, to be honest. Um, so there wasn't a ton of control. There was control when we had that luxury, I guess I'll say. Um, so it's it's still kind of a, a question what we want to do, you know, if anything with those with those kind of scraggly looking clusters, I'd say. That's, that's something that um, has yet to be kind of figured out. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Anna. Uh, and this might be more for Lance. Uh, how much does a powdery mildew bot cost? 
And can you see it being useful for other diseases? Yeah, thanks, Bruce, for that question. Um, so the powdery mildew bot, how much does it cost? I mean, as the PI, you've seen the budgets and it's expensive. Um, I, I asked this same question to um, a private company. We actually thought, hey, let's see if we can just have it built for us. It'll save us time. Um, they came back with $145,000 um, to build it. And I would guess that if you looked at our budgets, it's not far off when you include personnel and overhead and supplies. I think the biggest expense is in building the first one and building subsequent ones is, is not nearly as expensive. Um, and, and that cost includes the hardware and the software, uh, the validation uh, that it's working. Um, so anyway, it's an, it's an interesting question and uh, we can have more discussions about that later. Um, but about other diseases, so this imaging system is great for leaf discs and it doesn't matter what really uh, are the characteristics of those leaf discs. So uh, you could envision that work like we did on downy mildew with leaf discs. Uh, it's very amenable to this um, or black rot as you did uh, with, uh, with Beth. Uh, other diseases certainly could be imaged. I think, you know, anything that we, we have a, a resolution of two microns. So anything that's on a scale of two microns or larger, uh, you probably would be able to look at on leaf discs. And I would suggest that maybe this, this concept of the hardware that we've developed could also be adapted to phenotyping other things uh, where you have, you want to take uh, pictures of a, lo a lot of other things on a similar scale, one centimeter scale, you know. So uh, you could imagine putting flowers on there, or we've talked with people about apple blossoms um, or, or buds. Um, there may be a lot of different things that you might want to image on an array format, and I think that it could be pretty easily adapted to that, though Mark's group might shoot me for saying that maybe Danny or Mark want to uh, chat, add something in the chat if they disagree. So. <laughs> yeah, they're welcome to chime in. Um, let's see, we have <laughs> Bruce said, let's measure pollen size on the PM bot, okay? <laughs> um, so I think we're all out of questions for now. So I just want to take a minute to let everybody know about our new website, www.vitusgen2.org. Um, you can head there to see what we're up to, latest updates on projects, and I'll be posting the recording of this webinar and our previous webinar on that site. Um, we won't really be scheduled for any more webinars until the end of the year after harvest. Uh, we're looking at November and December, so look out for them then. And please keep in touch with us over Twitter. Um, email me if you have any questions. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to all our panelists. It was great. Everybody have a great day.